council, pre-council meeting will come to order Monday, April 15th. Uh, Chris, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Durrani? Here. Councilman Barber? Absent. Councilman Fisher? Here. Councilman Girl? Here. Councilman Hug? Here. Councilman Morris? Here. Councilman Odekirk? Here. Councilman McClellan? Here. Councilman Turk? Here. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we have a few <coughs> items to uh, address uh, before we get into the regular agenda. The first item is a presentation by Keith Pryor regarding the Illinois Housing Development <coughs> Authority and here to discuss the building block program. If Mr. Pryor could come forward. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. My name is Keith Pryor. I'm Assistant Director of Home Ownership Programs at the Illinois Housing Development Authority. And along with me, we have individuals who represent the local Lane community, as long as, as, as well as the Mayor of Lockport. And I'd like to say thank you for inviting us out. Um, we're very pleased to talk to you about the Building Blocks Program. My goal today is to, to give you a good overview of the program and then answer any questions that you may have. Building Blocks began roughly in 2012, March of 2012, as a pilot program announced by the governor that was designed to uh, return vacant and foreclosed properties back to productive use. And it was part of an overall comprehensive and coordinated effort to stabilize neighborhoods, protect pr property values, and maintain local bases, tax bases, excuse me. The program started in five communities, and within the first year, it won a national award. This year in March, the governor decided to expand the program to two, to, excuse me, to 10 additional communities, which include local communities, of course, Joliet, um, Lockport, and Crest Hill. Building Blocks is a two-part program. First part is an affordable housing first mortgage at a, a affordable rate, and today's market is at, is at 4%. But what really hammers the program home and makes the program an effective program is the second mortgage. On the second mortgage, it's a $10,000 forgivable mortgage. There isn't any monthly payments, nor is there interest rate. So it's forgiven over two years. While I'm not a person who can tell the future, uh, it's safe to say that, the, that we've pretty much reached the bottom of our market. So within two years, anyone who takes advantage of this program will likely have $10,000 in equity in the home, making it a viable, viable program. The program um, is, um, qualify for the program it has to be a vacant home in one of the participating communities um, vacant one or two unit properties and or to qualify you under our normal programs you typically have to be a first-time home buyer on um, this program you don't have to be so uh, we have income and purchase price limits income and purchase price limits are both um, generous in my opinion for a household size of one or two we're looking at an income limit of ninety thousand dollars and change in a household size of three or more, looking at over $106,000 income limit. Uh, the program was just recently announced in uh, the, the Will County areas, and we're very, very pleased to be here to talk to you. Um, with that, I'll turn it over. Would you like to say anything, Mayor? Thank you, Keith. Honorable Mayor and City Council, I'm very happy to be here, and the City of Lockport, and on behalf of citizens of Lockport, I want to say that this is a great program. Governor has started it. And I believe that the uh, city of Joliet, city of Crest Hill, and city of Lockport will work on it for years to come. And this is a program which I think in this economy is very much needed by the Will County community. So we appreciate it. I appreciate uh, Tom Girardi for all the support you have given me over my past uh, few years on the city council and as the mayor of city of Lockport. So thank you very much and goodbye to all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for serving. I'm Mary Morstadt with Standard Bank, and with me is Ann Robinson, our Joliet branch manager. We were a part of the pilot program uh, in the past year with the other cities, and we're thrilled that Joliet, Lockport, and Crest Hill are now a part of the program. Uh, we look forward to helping uh, uh, close more loans and get more properties um, occupied instead of vacant. So thank you very much. Could you answer how many banks are involved with this? Maybe you can answer that, uh, Keith. Uh, the original program started out with just six lenders, but once we opened the program to additional communities, it's an open to our entire lender network. So we're looking at approximately um, 200 um, lending institutions throughout the state who can offer the program. But in the areas that we serve here, we're generally looking at probably at a group of about 50 lenders that would really utilize the product. And that's a vast array from your larger lenders to um, local community banks as well. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Juliana Hackle, and I'm with BMO Harris Bank. And we were also one of the original banks that worked with the pilot program. And I just can't say enough about the program. It's wonderful for the community. It's wonderful, wonderful for those home buyers that can take advantage of it. So my congratulations to you and the Mayor of Blackport for being involved in this program. And I think you're going to see nothing but really, really good things come out of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Grego. I'm a vice president at First Advantage Mortgage. We are a Draper and Kramer company who's been involved in real estate for over 100 years. And we are very pleased to participate in this program. And we are looking forward to help all the individuals that want to take advantage of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Were, were there any questions? No, I just comment. Uh, I think this is a great program. There's no question it's going to help a lot of people that uh, are struggling right now to buy a home. And uh, you know, we thank the governor for, for all he's done to make this possible. Anybody else have any uh, comments? I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> have you gone to some of the neighborhoods where there are a lot of empty homes, the neighborhood organizations, to let them be aware of this uh, program? Well, we've done a comprehensive effort to get uh, um, community input and community involvement in the program, and we continue to do so. And if there's any areas that we may have missed, we're more than eager to come out and do a presentation and just to let them know. And so we're eager to work with you guys um, in any of the communities, for that matter, to really get the word out. And how would they contact you if they're watching this right now in their home? Well, if anyone's watching this right now and they have any questions about our program, they can either call me directly. Again, my direct line is area code 312-836-7348. Or they can call our general line and speak to anyone in, in the, at the authority, and they should be able to help. And that direct line to the, the main line to the authority is 312-836-5200. On our website, there's a special, site, special section excuse me, dedicated to the Building Blocks program, which will link to all the participating lenders who can offer the product. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. If I may, I just wanted to inter introduce myself. I'm uh, Bob Palmer. <coughs> I'm working with the City of Lockport as Director of Community Development. I'm very excited to work with your staff on this program. We've had a lot of good communication. We're very excited about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Keith, you, you said of some other cities in this area that you already have done this program with. Mm -hmm. I know you've mentioned Crest Hill, I believe, right? Right. Crest Hill and Lockport are the newer entries that started back in March. The original five communities, um, the original pilot communities, were Berwyn, Maywood, Park Forest, Chicago Heights, and South Holland. And so those are the ones we did last year. We expanded, expanded, I'm sorry, expanded, excuse me, to 10 other communities, three which are in the area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Keith, you, you had <clears throat> mentioned the, uh, the income caps. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, and you did mention there was a cap on the, I, I would assume, the, the cost of the house, the price of the house. What was the caps on that? Correct. Um, we, for the program, as well as all of our products, we only do one and two unit properties. In the, the Will County area, we're looking at, and they're pretty generous, for one unit, 378000 and for two units, 484000 Considering the products uh, that we're dealing with largely bank at homes, uh, we're going to have a vast array of people and properties that can qualify. And is it... Uh, Will there be preference given, let's say, if somebody is um, a family of three at 50000 and that family of three of 102000 applies, would there be a preference given to the... Uh, well, we have funding for both. For, so there's no cap on how many can participate? There's no cap, no. It, it's, um, first go is first come, first serve. From my experience, uh, this program typically runs over a year, so we have enough funding to, to accommodate anyone who wants to who qualifies. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Thank you, folks. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Like a great project, Mayor. Good luck to you. Thank All right. you. All right. Thank you for your time and consideration. Sure. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we uh, have issued one media release already, and Alfred will be uh, reissuing that media release. We'll do the best we can to get the word out. And before Mayor Trevetti leaves, I, Mayor? if I could just say one uh, personal thanks to Mayor Trevetti. Um, <laughs> Mayor Trevetti's taken a leadership role in public transportation issues for our area. We've partnered with Lockport, Romeoville, um, uh, Lamont, and a few other towns to try to get the attention of Metro on many <coughs> issues. And uh, Congressman Lipinski has jumped in to help us quite a bit. So uh, really has taken a, a great le leadership role and has set the tone as uh, Lockport leading in that area. So we thank him for all that. I'm sure that will continue on with the new administration. A few agenda items, if we can move them up. Uh, first one is Council Memo Number 173-13. It's a liquor license for the uh, expansion of uh, the beer garden hours at Liquid Therapy. Mr. Murphy. <coughs> 
Thank you. A hearing was held on April 3, 2013 regarding the issuance of a full outdoor beer garden permit for 3501 Shanahan Road doing business as Liquid Therapy, Inc. No one appeared in opposition to the request. A full outdoor permit would let the licensee operate a beer garden in tandem with their current extra hour permit, which allows them to remain open until 2 a.m. Sunday through Thursday and 3 a.m. Friday and Saturday. There are no outstanding monies owed to the city. Chief Trafton does not oppose the outdoor permit. However, he was concerned about the number of calls for service at this location last year. The Liquor Commission addressed the issue with the licensee last year, and since then, there has been a significant decrease in the number of calls for service to this address. The applicants have indicated that they will provide their own security Thursday through Sunday. The Liquor Commissioner is recommending approval pending appropriate security measures are implemented. Question? <coughs> Comment. Uh, I know in the, on the agenda it says that the chief is recommending off-duty police officers. Um, can we address that with the police, and maybe uh, Mr. Benton would like to address that. Um, the calls for service have decreased considerably since these people took over, and with that in mind, uh, we made an agreement that they can use their own security, but if they have problems, they're going to have to hire off-duty police officers. <laughs> Commander Benton, you want to address that, please? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, I have Chief Trafton's correspondence here. He agrees with closer monitoring. Uh, they have done a good job of reducing the calls for service so far this year, and uh, we will closely monitor, but perhaps an uh, off-duty uh, police officer would be uh, the next step if they continue to have the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move on this today, Mayor? Sure, absolutely. Motion to approve. Second. Questions? Do we have uh, wording? In writing that I may have looked over, uh, get, uh, laying out how many calls of service would kick in that we would require off duty police officers? Do we have an agreement one. that solid? I believe the mayor and liquor commissioner said one call for service. If there's Not issues. No wording, though. We don't have any wording. No, that's what your question was. No. But if they, can, if they use their own private security and if there is an issue with their own private security, they will then be required to use City of Joliet off duty police officers. Not in right. But it's not in the agreement, in, in no. and it probably should be. Thank. No, I I don't have any problem either. As does uh, the chief uh, Trafton. So chief Tra uh, chief Trafton uh, okayed this. Yes. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. He he did agree. Um, at this time, uh, he, he's accepting to the private security, but he's just concerned if the calls for service increase to the point where they were last year, we would need to take right. some uh, extra measures. Mr. Mayor, if I can offer a comment on this as sure. well. Um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, liquor hearings and indeed this meeting today uh, will all be part of a record that will attach to the license. So these discussions, these commitments are all disclosed to the operator. They're all a part of the record. Now, in terms of enforcing it in the future, if a need should arise, I would expect that if there was an issue that private security could not <clears throat> handle, that there would be some incident that would trigger the Liquor Commissioner's jurisdiction anyway to issue a citation and have a hearing. And as part of that process, assuming that uh, an appropriate legal case was established, there would be some sort of sanction entered against the licensee along with some implementation of the additional security that we're discussing today. <coughs> so it, if there is an incident, it would trigger the jurisdiction of the Liquor Commissioner to hold a hearing to uh, establish some sort of appropriate penalty uh, for licensing misconduct, and then to establish a condition at that time requiring uh, the hiring back of trained law enforcement, if under the circumstances it seemed appropriate then. Question. Sure. <clears throat> it would seem to me we're doing this backwards because the chief in his recommendation said he highly recommends off-duty police officers to be hired for weekend assignments. So um, he's changed his mind since the hearing? Because my thought on this is why not hire from the get-go the off-duty police officers and then if there's no calls for service, then you could go back to your um, uh, private security. Brian, if I, uh, Commander, if I can address that. The problem was, as I stated, the previous owners had a lot of problems. They had a change in ownership and since the ownership has changed, the calls for service has dropped tremendously. So I think if I may speak for Chief Trapman, based on that, 
he agreed to allow them to provide their own security. How long, um, how long are trial going to give them? Uh, I'll, it'll go this way until they have problems. When they have problems, I call them in for a hearing, and I tell them, hey, you got to hire off-duty police. Who's the private security, sir? Who is your security? Your private, who is your private security? He has a little hearing impairment. Who's the private security right. that you're going to have? We, uh, we have uh, a group of uh, ex-military uh, that are working for us. It's not a formal security firm. We interview and hire our own staff. And you hire them as opposed to off-duty police officers because? What is you hire them as opposed to officers, off-duty security because? Oh, th the uh, uh, off-duty officers would be uh, financially really prohibitive. Uh, uh, money-wise to uh, to make uh, ends meet and how long have you owned this property now uh, we've uh, we will have been open uh, two years this June uh, we've owned the property uh, two years last December so you were the owner when all these calls for service were coming about correct you were the owner when they had to call I can address that part of it. <coughs> okay I'm Don Gould the attorney <coughs> for the applicant liquid therapy there were a lot of calls in early 2012. You may recall that this was in unincorporated Will County, and then we annexed to the city of Joliet. And under the terms of the annexation agreement, that was effective January 1 of 2012. If you look, and we looked at the call sheet when we had the liquor hearing, but those number of calls have decreased dramatically. And we worked with uh, the mayor and the, the police department and really, things have been going quite well recently. And it was the, the liquor commissioner's determination that as we have private security in place right now, to keep that in place. We have a beer garden, but it has to close, I believe, 11 o'clock during the week, 12 o'clock on the weekends. So we do lose, as you can imagine, it's a business decision. You lose a lot of customers because they go someplace else after 12 o'clock. Um, but we were in agreement that if there were problems in the future, we would have to go ahead and hire off-duty uh, off police. But we have a good rapport, a rapport with the police department, and things, you know, frankly, have been, have been going better. Can you just give me the time when the calls for service started going down? You know, you, you may have that. I don't have it with me. Councilwoman, they are later at night, and... Uh, they have I mean t um, the, date. Jim, the date like you know for two years you had all these calls for service and then they have significantly gone down from what what time frame is that probably within the past five or six months five or they've six noticeably months. gone down and you have to remember with any liquor establishment if there's a call for service say I'm, dr I'm driving down <coughs> route six where this is located if I have an issue and I see a, a, a business I go in that call for service gets assigned I, to that business so well, in, in fairness to all liquor establishments, not every call for service is a critical issue. There's, there's ongoing circumstances. But clearly, this uh, establishment, when they opened, there were issues. But they've also really tried to rectify it. So which leads me to my next question then. Uh, the calls for service have gone down because they have new security in place or uh, what? I believe after the liquor commissioner met with them last year, when the calls for service were quite excessive, they got the message. And they have really, really made an effort. But was there security in place before? I don't believe you had security in place before. When did you, have, when did you start bringing security in? You didn't have what it initially? We, oh, yes, we did. We had security right away. Mm -hmm. uh, why, we, we what have, was the reason why the calls went down? The reason why the calls went down? Oh. Our service calls uh, drop dramatically uh, because there's a little bit of a learning curve. I've got a big uh, food and beverage background. I've been with the Hyatt and the Hilton for 25 plus years. <clears throat> but uh, opening the, the business in this area is a little bit different demographic. And uh, there was a learning curve as to uh, dress code and, and, and uh, behavior and that type of thing. And the uh, patrons uh, get the message as to what kind of an establishment uh, uh, we're trying to maintain and uh, the behavioral expectations. Uh, our 
most recent issues have been people that have been denied entry and they refuse to leave the property or people that we ask to leave and they refuse to leave. Uh, it's uh, a real big improvement over what we were confronting initially. We started security right away, Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. We have security. When we anticipate a uh, unusually busy night, we'll add uh, a, a third security officer or security presence. We always run two. Okay, so my question is, again, when you had the 50 calls for service, you had security in place, but they couldn't handle it? Is that what the problem was? She said when you, she, you initially had the problem and when they had the 50 calls for service, why wasn't security able to handle that? But I mean... Well, uh, because <clears throat> the we call the uh, uh, police when there's... Uh, a, a battery when someone's touching somebody else or pushing someone else that's uh, that's why we call now uh, the uh, a lot of people a lot of patrons aren't coming back that were problem patrons and uh, we uh, have we've always been proactive but we're really really try to be proactive as far as who's coming in and uh, what kind of atmosphere uh, is maintained okay all right thank you Anybody else? Krista? It's motion and seconded. John Maseric and James <coughs> Daniels doing business as liquid therapy be issued a Class O liquor license with expanded hours. Councilman Fisher? Aye. Councilman Girl? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Odekirk? Aye. Councilman Coleman? Since you answer all my questions to my satisfaction right now, and I appreciate that, I will vote aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Mayor Gerani? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, two items. Council Memo 155-13 and 164-13. If you could go to 155 first. I know it's difficult to do two at the same time on the iPads. Uh, this is a resolution authorizing an, an agreement with the Warren Sharp Community Center for the demolition of the structure at 472 South Joliet Street. Uh, this is the old YMCA that was built many years ago. Uh, Warren Sharp Community Center has had, it, has had uh, ownership of it for many years, but it's fallen into disrepair. And in meeting with the Warren Sharp Center, uh, it was determined that the best course of action is for the structure to be demolished. Uh, we do have neighborhood stabilization program funding made available through the federal government for situations like this. Uh, the recommendation from the staff is to move forward with the demolition using NSP funds. Um, Council Memo 164-13 is the actual award of contract to, uh, to Beckstein Corporation in the amount of just under $59,000. Uh, we have adequate funds in the NSP account, and we're recommending moving forward with both items. Uh, Kathleen uh, Bolden is present uh, today, uh, along with Judge Raymond Bolden. If you have any questions, I'm sure Kathleen would be more than happy to answer them for you. Good afternoon, Mayor Girani, City Manager Thanis, Council Members. I'm Kay Bolden, Executive Director of the Warren Sharp Center. Uh, as you know, we moved from that old building into our current location at 454 South <coughs> Joliet Street. Back in 1993, uh, the city uh, provided a great deal of financial support for the renovation of that old building and the addition that was added in 2003 as our programs continue to outgrow our space. Uh, the building at 472 has not been in use since uh, about 1996. It is uh, a very concern to us about the safety issues um, because of the state of the building and uh, we uh, will appreciate your assistance with this matter for our neighborhood. Thank you. Any questions? Can we can we move on this today? I think we yes. can do this. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Packing. It's been motioned and seconded. Said resolution be adopted and Council Memo 164-13 be approved. Councilman Girl. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Odekirk. Aye. Councilman Coleman. Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Councilman Fisher. Aye. Mayor Durrani. Just for the record, that was Delboni's Club 472 years ago. I vote aye. <laughs> Motion carried. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, if we could have Jeff Hetrick from uh, Commonwealth Edison uh, approach the podium. Uh, Jeff's still here. Uh, he actually handed out a, um, a flyer on assistance available for residents for paying electric bills, and he asked for a couple of minutes just to address the flyer. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the flyer is talking about a program we're putting on for the 
Will County Center for Community Concerns. It is next Tuesday, uh, starts at 9 a.m., runs until noon. We are bringing ComEd employees uh, downtown. What we're trying to do is there are a number of ComEd programs for low income, for elderly, even for military personnel who may be falling behind on their electric bill. So we're trying to bring everybody together to sign them up uh, at the center, and we would welcome anybody to stop by. Uh, we'll be able to pull up your accounts, sign you up right away, and uh, do what we can to take care of the citizens of Joliet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we can go back to the uh, beginning of the agenda. Uh, we'll have the approval of the minutes of the April 1st and April 2nd city council meetings for your review. Uh, council committee reports will follow that. And then agenda items, we have a report from the assistant city treasurer on the investment of municipal funds as part of the consent agenda. Council memo 147-13 is a request from the administration to fill two vacancies in the Joliet Police Department. The vacancies have arisen due to retirements of uh, longtime police officers who have retired in the last couple of weeks. We're asking for authorization to fill those uh, to keep our commitment to um, staffing as we have in the 2013 budget. Next item, 148-13, is a request for a special use permit for an auto repair shop at 511 Theodore Street. This is a uh, warehouse space that used to be occupied by the Hostess Bread <coughs> Distribution Warehouse. Uh, it's been vacated and now is uh, under, uh, it, actually the request is coming from Masters Automotive in Joliet. Uh, the owner of the property is Joe and Jay Gregory. The manager of the property is Anthony Hill. And the... Uh, owner is Socrates Mahaya of the business. There's a request to uh, move forward with an automotive repair <coughs> shop. Uh, it's be actually being relocated from where it was previously at 1210 uh, Plainfield Road. Uh, that facility went out of business. Uh, the proprietor would like to relocate to the Theodore Street site. This would be a full so service operation, no auto body work, three employees, three lifts. Uh, this went before the Zoning Board of Appeals on March 21st. Uh, no one appeared in opposition. The ZBA voted unanimously uh, to recommend approval of the special use permit, and the administration is recommending the same. I don't know if anybody's in the, the audience today on this item. Yeah, Jay is, yeah. All right. I don't know if you have any questions. I'm sure Jay would be happy to answer them. Anybody have any questions? Unless you want to make a couple comments, up to you. Okay. This will be on, yep, this will be on tomorrow night's right. agenda, yeah. then. Next item, 149-13 is an ordinance authorizing the seating of our volume cap uh, to two entities. One is the Will Kankakee Regional Development Authority, and the second would go towards the Assist Mortgage Credit Certificate Program. Uh, as you may recall, annually we're asked to seed our tax-exempt private activity bond authority uh, to various agencies. We usually have ceded that authority to the Will Kankakee Regional Development Authority. This year, though, we're recommending that we split that and do a little over $4 million to the uh, Will Kankakee D uh, Regional Development Authority and uh, $10 million for the Mortgage Credit uh, Assistance Program. Uh, and consistent with the presentation from uh, Mr. Pryor, uh, the housing market starting to pick up a little bit, and we thought this would be a more appropriate use, uh, helping uh, people with purchasing homes and getting into the housing market. Uh, staff is recommending we move forward with the seating of the uh, of our volume cap. Next item is 151-13. It's a resolution appropriating MFT funds, motor fuel tax funds, for the city's road, <coughs> roadway resurfacing contract for 2013. Another council memo, 161-13, is an award of a contract for that program, and I believe it's about $1.3 million, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, uh, road, roadway resurfacing. Uh, the, that contract will be reviewed by the Public Service Committee tomorrow morning when it meets. This is the MFT resolution. Next item, 152-13, is a re resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the county, Will County, for the McDonough Street project. 
Uh, the county has jurisdiction of McDonough Street from Infantry Drive to Hobolt Road. Uh, the, the county has agreed to pursue a road, re road reconstruction project of <coughs> $5.1 million. Uh, the city's share is just over $400,000. We're appropriating uh, uh, some MFT money for that. We also have some developer money from a previous development on the south side of McDonough to put into uh, the project. Staff is recommending approval of the intergovernmental agreement attached to the council memo. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I had talked to Jim Trisna earlier today because I'd had some uh, complaints from the folks that live over in um, Coventry Chase. They were asking for a turning lane, and I'm sure they've talked to Councilman Girl as well. They have. So I asked Jim to come today to explain for the record what exactly is going to be done, and it'll be a safer road. So, Jim, would you mind doing that, if that's okay with the mayor? Actually, there was a development this morning. Uh, County Executive Walsh called me this morning at about 10 o'clock and asked if there was any participation coming from the city. We had denied the participation. Uh, the turning lane would cost about $50,000. Uh, the county is considering uh, paying for half of the turn lane, and the residents were asking for the city to pay for the other half. Uh, in reviewing this with Jim on a couple of fronts. One is we don't have any budgeted funds for this project. And the second part is the, um, uh, the traffic study that was done when the turn lane, turn lane request was made to the county shows us there's about 22 movements a day uh, turning into Oakwood. And at, uh, when we heard that information, we responded and indicated that we would not be participating. Um, the county called this morning asking if we would reconsider. Um, I told them that I probably wouldn't be in a position to reconsider, um, considering that this is for westbound traffic. You don't have to stop in a, tr in a travel lane to make that turn. It's one continuous move. It, it, we don't perceive it to be an unsafe situation. But if the property owners, uh, through their homeowners association, were willing to put up $15,000 of the remaining 25, we would consider uh, the participating with the remaining $10,000. Uh, I think, and I don't know how many units are there, but I'm guessing about 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. It's probably three or four hundred dollars, maybe 500 at the most per unit. Uh, this is one of those things that we really don't have money set aside for this. Uh, we could probably reallocate some funds that are going to another project for this if it's uh, if it's bought down to ten thousand. So that was done in the spirit of cooperation with the county. Mayor, so um, have the homeowners been approached about that? Well, they just heard about it for the first time this morning. Mr. Sapaniak was in uh, County Executive Walsh's office when the call was made. Oh, okay. So um, uh, you know my firm answer about three or four weeks ago was a definite no, uh, but my definite no weakened a bit today uh, in the interest of trying to help the homeowners uh, with this. Uh, as you may recall, we have spent a lot of money on that stretch of road in McDonough through the years using NIP funds going back probably seven or eight years ago, doing the berm, the fence, the landscaping. Uh, so there's been probably six figures worth of investment on the south side of the road already to help buffer Oakwood Estates from Silverleaf, the development on the south. But what, um, what was requested today was trying to help facilitate the turn lane. And again, I didn't want to overcommit us, but I thought that a $10,000 investment would be reasonable. But we certainly need the homeowners to help participate in that just to get everybody buying into it. I don't know how Jim will handle it with his HOA board. I think he's either the treasurer or the VP of the board. I'm sure they'll meet and we'll hear, we'll hear back from them in the next couple of weeks. But if that's not to take place, Jim, can you explain just a little bit uh, what we talked about this morning about the safety overall? If that doesn't happen, if the homeowners don't agree. Yeah, um, this project itself is gonna provide more safety. Uh, currently, McDonough Street, just a two lane um, rural roadway with open ditches. Uh, this project the county's constructing is going to be a three-lane roadway. So currently, if you're traveling eastbound on McDonough and you want to turn north and turn, make a left-hand turn to turn into Oakwood Estates, you're sitting in, in the flow of traffic. Um, after this project is done, there will be a designated left turn lane, which is going to assist that movement. The other thing, as I, as I explained to Jan earlier, again, and Tom kind of said also, there's only there's, there's a, you know, 22 movements a day <coughs> making that right-hand turn. Um, the speed limit's fairly low, I think it's 35 miles per hour. And we also checked our, our accident records. There were no accidents over the last three years of this nature. You know, rear, it would be a rear end collision if you were having problems with folks trying to head eastbound and make a right hand turn and head north into Oakwood States. So again, that's the iterate. That's 
that's why, and, and the, there's one last thing, there was a, a traffic study done by the county's engineer that again deemed this not necessary. So based on all the above, you know, we did not recommend putting any money towards this. Thanks. I was not aware of that uh, hearing that's, that went, took place this morning. This Actually, it was, it was a telephone conference call while I was on another conference call. So it was really done in oh, a hurry okay. this morning with no paperwork, no email. It was just the preliminary call from the county executive's office asking if we could help this situation out. I know it's been reviewed uh, at the county. I think the county engineer has denied the request several times, as we have. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I think those of you who know... Um, Mr. Stefaniak, uh, he's, he's, he's fairly persistent. persistent. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, actually about, uh, just to give a little background on this, about, uh, I think maybe it was about a month or two ago, the county uh, really wasn't part, uh, kicking in anything as far as this additional $50,000. And Mr. Stefaniak and I and a few of the uh, <clears throat> Homeowners Association uh, members or the members of uh, the residents that live in, in that subdivision actually went to the uh, public uh, public uh, works committee meeting, and they did agree to split the cost of the twenty five thousand um, dollars. I think that's a great gesture, uh, Tom. Um, if we could come up ten or fifteen thousand dollars, and I, I believe that Mr. Shapaniak, I think the residents have a homeowners meeting, maybe in the next week or so. Um, so we should have something from them as far as uh, uh, you know what their commitment is going to be. Have you talked to uh, Mr. Shapaniak and all? Was d is he aware of? that they may have to come up with, say, $10,000 or $12,000? He, he, he was on the call in Larry's office okay, when so they called me. Yes. Got it. So uh, okay. Jim heard it directly from me. And, right. um, and again, it's, you know, the, they've been very, well, it's a great development. They've been great Joliet residents. But, you know, we are trying to budget our sure. capital uh, improvement yeah. funds the best we can. Right. And really what we're trying to do is get people in line so we can do this in order. Yeah. Uh, a $10,000 contribution. And, again, I, I think this benefits the homeowners more than it benefits the public. So that's why I was, I was trying to get some homeowner participation on this. Uh, and so they would pick up. I know you said 10 or 15 for the city. I said 10, and I'd like to stay at 10, 15,000 from the HOA. Sure. Jim, we'll take your comments and just kind okay. of turn <laughs> right around on me. I, I, think it's, I think it's a nice gesture on the city's. <laughs> Uh, I think that's fair. To yeah. participate, well, yeah. I think it's a very generous gesture because, you know, you're talking 22 movements and there hadn't been an accident in three years, right. so they're going west. They have no problem turning in there. I think it's a very generous gesture. Yeah. Our recommendations move forward with the agreement tomorrow evening, and then we'll report back to you, uh, either Public Service Committee or the full council, <coughs> as to how this got uh, resolved. Right. Thanks, Tom, for following up. Thank you. Next item, 153-13 uh, is the MFT uh, resolution for the McDonough Street project, allocating uh, the funding for that project. Next item, uh, MFT money uh, resolution for the Washington Street Bridge uh, reconstruction over Spring Creek. Uh, the city's pursuing that with uh, MFT funds. The cost is $11,442 for uh, this portion of the city's uh, contribution towards the project. We're recommending approval of that. I know this will get reviewed by the Public Service Committee tomorrow morning also. 155 we've handled already. 156-13 is a resolution supporting a recovery agreement between HUD and the Housing Authority of Joliet. Uh, last year when uh, the Housing Authority received uh, an, un an unsatisfactory performance evaluation, uh, certain um, uh, dictates were uh, given to the Housing Authority by HUD. Uh, the agreement uh, that they are ready to enter into address all of the concerns that HUD had. HUD has made a request that the city review and endorse and support the recovery agreement that the Housing Authority will be pursuing. Uh, the agreement itself is attached to the council memo. It's been reviewed by city staff and by Mr. Plyman, and the staff is recommending that we support the recovery agreement and the efforts of the Housing Authority to get back in compliance with HUD. Next item, uh, Council Memo 157-13 is a resolution author authorizing the release of closed session or executive session minutes. Uh, the Illinois Open Meetings Act requires the uh, City Council to review from time to time the minutes of closed sessions and to release those that uh, the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Uh, we as a staff have reviewed those minutes and uh, those were provided to you uh, by separate uh, uh, distribution. Uh, we're recommending release of the closed session minutes. If you have concerns about releasing any of them in particular, let us know between now and tomorrow night. 
Next item, 159-13 uh, is the regular payroll for March 28th, 2013. And then we have the regular claims for March and the treasurer's dis disbursements for March, that both of which will be reviewed by the Finance Committee immediately after this meeting. And then the remainder of the agenda is the award of contracts that will be reviewed by the uh, Public Service Committee tomorrow morning at 7.15 in the planning conference room. Uh, we did have a couple of additions to the, uh, uh, to the agenda packet. Uh, there was a to be submitted item for a quiet zone application, a big step in getting quiet zones uh, completed. That's council memo number 166. That was uh, handed out uh, this afternoon and we'll ask you to uh, refresh your iPad so you get that. And I think, was there one more, Krista? There was one yesterday, um, which was the uh, council memo 156-13. They were emailed. Okay, and yeah, that's it. Okay. So uh, we'll have a couple of proclamations for tomorrow night, and that concludes the presentation of the agenda. We have no citizens signed up to be heard today, and we do have a request for a closed session. Oh, okay. Lady have sure. hand up. Ma'am, step up to the, give your name and address, please. Do I have a motion to? Uh, so moved. Second. Mm -mm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. I'm not familiar on how council issues and how do we do this. My name is Denise Meehan. I'm a member, a uh, resident of Joliet um, Municipal. Um, address, my address please. is 6613 Irma Harvey Lane. <coughs> I wanted to approach the, the council meeting and each of the council members um, with a flyer, if I may hand it to you. May I? Sure, give it to Krista and she'll pass it down. I'm here as a um, representative of Kenny Post 367, Ladies Auxiliary of the VFW. We are having an inaugural, or first ever, anywhere event, the Veteran Community Outreach Day on April 27th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. This event is wholly unique in that we've been able to bring service providers who will actually provide services, not just information, to the veteran community. Um, we have the VA is coming out with their mobile health center. They will be providing health screenings and claims filing assistance to benefits to the veteran community, which are priceless considering the 900,000 case backlog with the VA right now. We have. Um, the Will County Veterans Assistance Commission that will be coming out, they provide emer emergency and interim financial assistance directly to veterans, um, not just veterans of foreign wars, but to all veterans if there's need for, say, um, I heard ComEd saying that they're helping with uh, veterans and electric bills, but uh, utilities or other immediate emergency financial needs, they will be there taking assistance, taking intake. And we have another group calling the VET Center that will be coming. They are the best kept secret in the veteran community. Primarily because until recently the VA has been prohibited legally from advertising services and the VA funds the VET Center. However, the VET Center is a wholly separate and unique organization. They provide counseling services to combat veterans from all wars. They are funded by the VA but per a very interesting agreement, the VA funds them, but they do not report to the VA, to the military, to DOD, or the Pentagon for active duty, reserve, or veterans on any services they provide, which include mental health, individual, family, bereavement, um, financial, job placement, and PTS counseling. So it's a wholly unique organization. They are bringing a their, what they call their mobile office, which is a full-size Winnebago for immediate um, counseling services, and they will have counselors on hand at the event. The biggest item on our agenda for the Veteran Community Outreach Day on the 27th <coughs> that is of interest to the general community and to the general public is we're having, we're sponsoring and being honored by allowing, being allowed to display the Illinois Patriot Guard Fallen Heroes Traveling Memorial Wall. If you've never seen this display, it is the most moving and memorable tribute that you can imagine. Every face and name 
the Illinois Fallen are on that wall. It is sponsored, supported, and run by the Gold Star families of Illinois, both the American Gold Star Mothers of Illinois as well as the Gold Star Dads of Illinois, which is a, a newly formed group. We're having, <coughs> we've had outreach to every veteran and community organization that we can find, and I was hoping that Joliet City Council would be willing, the council members would be willing to help spread the word about this event of ours and allow us to do our job, to do our mission, which is to support our veterans. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for that your time. Like a great, any questions? Uh, great program. I don't have anybody. <coughs> Can we ask? Sure. Did, did you uh, communicate with the uh, community television too to get to make just sure? I'm just gonna say that. That is, thank you very much. That is on my list and something I'm hoping to do. This is the first time I've ever done any such thing. So I'm really like thrown into the deep end and learning. So if there's community television here and if they're willing to talk oh. to me, woohoo. He's in the back room. Yes. Saul, <laughs> Saul, we have a job for you out here when we get time. Okay. And the same thing, any contacts with the Herald if, you know. Right behind you. Right behind you. Bob O'Connor. Right behind you. A bugle. If we can have, um, what, I, what I would like to see happen is I'd like to have this put in the community events calendar, but I would also like to see a news article put out because People read news articles before they read the community calendar. And this is an incredible event that we're, we're really excited and actually getting a little scared mm -hmm. about, but in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. No. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we've had some inquiries about the swearing-in ceremony and uh, the timing of it. The, um, we've had a couple of different models that have been followed in the past. I believe the Code of Ordinances says the first meeting, first Monday in May. the first Monday in May. So um, if, if it's all right with you, we'll go ahead and schedule that. If you'd like to do that at 3.30, we could do it when pre-council is usually held, or if you'd like to do it at 6.30 in the evening. Uh, when it may be more convenient for a larger crowd that may want to be here for swearing, we could do it then. And then my suggestion is uh, we would uh, just have that as a ceremonial meeting and then come back the next night, Tuesday night, and have our regular city council meeting. Uh, we would not have a pre-council meeting, though, uh, that day. So with your permission, I'll go ahead and schedule that for, it sounds like 6.30 works better without than, objection. Yep, 6.30 on Monday. Monday, yeah. Do you think we'll know by then? <laughs> yep, <you> will. Well, <laughs> <I think so. laughs> got to make, make light of it. I mean, it, what yeah, can I know, we I, do? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, if I could suggest perhaps a reality TV show where we would just announce the winners at that <laughs> 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 and we could sell ads. Uh, so. so we do have a re I'm sorry. Just a couple things. Yes. One, um, baseball committee meeting tomorrow night, 530 in the executive, com executive conference room. And second thing for those people that have seen me hobbling around for the last two months, uh, I'm fine, it's just my knee's bad, I need a new knee, uh, I got an appointment with a surgeon next Monday, so hopefully in a couple of months I'll be ready for run a marathon, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to go in executive so session? Moved. Second. Motion and seconded to go into closed session to discuss personnel, collective bargaining, land acquisition or conveyance pending or threatened litigation after which meeting will be adjourned. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Odekirk? Aye. Councilman Cloman? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilman Fisher? Aye. Councilman Girl? Aye. Mayor Durrani? Aye. I don't think they did. I don't know if I was allowed to do that, but yeah. I read it. I was, yes, both. No, they both. Yes, they did. Oh, wow.